shall dedicate myself to your service. Not based upon some rigid creed, but bound together by ideals and aspirations. Elizabeth II, Britain's longest serving monarch. She's reigned over this country for nearly 70 years. She is a woman of remarkable stamina. She is the most famous woman in the world. She's seen a man land on the moon and 14 prime ministers come and go. But 400 years earlier, there was another Queen Elizabeth. Elizabeth I is this brilliant, genius queen. Now, we're setting the two Elizabeths side by side to see if, despite the centuries, there is more that unites than divides them. The idea of comparing the two Elizabeths is immensely fascinating. It might look on the surface that they have nothing in common, but when you dig a little deeper, the story becomes even more extraordinary. In the second part of this series, we discover how both Elizabeth's reigns are changed with the arrival of two extraordinary women. Both Mary Queen of Scots and Princess Diana take our two queens on difficult journeys. In fact, there are an awful lot of parallels, almost a magical quality to them. We uncover remarkable similarities. This letter is astonishing. Once upon a time, they were best friends. Now they are mortal rivals. And reveal how these young women both threaten to destroy the reigns of two of our greatest monarchs. The story of Queen Elizabeth I and Elizabeth II's rise to the throne has revealed some intriguing similarities. Both women rose from royal obscurity to become popular and successful monarchs. And their journey has made them both unflinching and dedicated queens. What unites the two queens is their sense of tradition and duty. But neither of the Elizabeths were supposed to be queen at all. They had a fairly tortuous path to the throne. But that wasn't the end of their battle. It was just the beginning. Both Elizabeths battle with two very different women that enter their lives. Mary, Queen of Scots and Princess Diana. In 1981, Elizabeth II's eldest son and heir to the throne, Prince Charles, marries the 20-year-old Lady Diana Spencer. Ring, I be wed. I be wed. And it's immediately clear that the Queen has gained a very special new member of her family. The whole world was transfixed by this dazzling young woman coming in, um, livening up, frankly, the slightly boring old British monarchy. It's a huge moment in society. The wedding, it's gigantic. It's much bigger than the Queen's wedding. The millions and millions watching it. The millions of girls getting married in exactly the same dress with exactly the same hair. The Queen is thrilled to see such a rapturous welcome for her new daughter-in-law. She believes Diana has all the makings of a perfect princess. Although she was very young, she came from a very aristocratic dynasty. The Spencers go way back in history. And of course, her father had been a query to the queen. She knew the royal family really from childhood. Diana was the virgin bride that her son, Prince Charles, needed in order to provide an heir and settle the future succession. So Diana was seen as the great hope of the royal family. And the perfect match quickly bears fruit. Diana produced very, very quickly, giving birth to William within a year and then shortly afterwards to Prince Harry. So she had the heir, she had the spare heir. She had absolutely fulfilled her wifely duty as the Queen saw it. Four hundred years earlier, Elizabeth I learns of a new arrival into her royal circle. 
1561, Mary Stuart returns from France to become Queen of Scotland. Mary has lived in Europe since childhood, but she has a rightful claim to the Scottish throne. And she is also Elizabeth I's cousin. Elizabeth hopes that having her relative on the throne will keep the Kingdom of Scotland stable and protect her own position. Elizabeth I believed that Mary Queen of Scots was the legitimate sovereign of Scotland and therefore should be restored to her throne and that they did have that kind of common purpose as queens. Mary quite often writes to her as my cousin and my sister. There is at least one letter from Elizabeth where she writes to Mary saying, I'm thinking of you as a mother doth. Elizabeth is relieved that Mary has been warmly accepted by her Scottish subjects. In fact, Mary is making a big impression. She is a Tudor fairy tale. Mary, Queen of Scots, had a real charisma about her. She was a great beauty, she was very tall, she would draw people to her. The whole of Europe's fascinated by her. And when she comes back to take her throne, Scotland is overwhelmed. The hysteria to see her, she is like the Diana of her day. Diana is this megawatt, this celebrity. You know, people, people are obsessed by her and the press go wild for her. In 1984, Queen Elizabeth II opens parliament and her new daughter-in-law, Diana, attends the ceremony. But she rapidly becomes a distraction from important royal business. So the queen here descending from the state carriage with Princess Diana by her side. But more of the world's attention is focused on the princess rather than the monarch. Why? Well, because of how Princess Diana has chosen to style herself. She has this incredibly new hairstyle, very unlike anything she, she's worn before almost a, a natural magnetism that she seems to have, drawing the eye of the camera. This is all about the state opening of Parliament. It's the Queen that should be the centre, not the Princess. On the following morning, the press are not focused on the political agenda. They're not even focused on Elizabeth II. All of these headlines about Diana's striking hairstyle, it was Diana that was the sort of centre of attention. The Queen was furious. Diana's celebrity is starting to overshadow matters of the crown. And Elizabeth I is also becoming concerned about Mary's rapidly growing popularity. She asks to see a portrait of the beautiful Scottish monarch. What I think is so striking about this image is Mary's hairstyle. So long hair, which has been trussed up and then held in place by these pearls and this gold hairnet. At the time, this would have been quite unusual, I think. It is a sort of rival image, if you like, to that of Elizabeth I. Here you have a different version of what beauty and power could look like. I mean, let's not forget that Mary traced her ancestry to Henry VII in the same way, of course, that Elizabeth did too. So this could be a rival candidate. And Elizabeth is asking all manner of questions about Mary's appearance. What's her hair like? And of course, crucially, who is better? And there are some really striking parallels between those images of Diana with this presentation of Mary, Queen of Scots. Both women have a little bit more license to play with their image, and that makes them more alluring. That's the nature of the challenge that they pose, a reminder to both Elizabeth I and Elizabeth II that their power could be precarious. In a short space of time, it's becoming clear to Elizabeth I and II that the attention Mary and Diana are drawing might not be such good news. The Queen's role was to be head of state. 
Princess Diana's role was to be future joint head of state. But Princess Diana was so successful in her role uh, that she was seen as a threat to the established order. People are following her. She's all over the press. They're copying her hairstyle. Just in the same way, people are trying to emulate Mary and how she's dressing. They become style icons, but so much more than that. Mary and Diana present a rather beguiling alternative to the person who is on the throne. And therein lay the secret of their popularity, but also the threat that they posed to the two Elizabeths. Soon it will become clear to both Elizabeths that the two younger women are becoming a problem. Elizabeth I and Elizabeth II both place the importance of the crown before anything else. But now, the presence of two young female relatives, Mary Queen of Scots and Princess Diana, is beginning to have an impact on the popularity of the monarchy. The proximity of these glamorous fairy tale figures, this romantic alternative model of monarchy is going to present them with some of their most testing times. Just a few years after entering the royal circle, it appears that Mary and Diana may not be the fairy tale our Elizabeths had hoped for. And the situation soon becomes more problematic when both Diana's and Mary's marriages start to go wrong. The controversial fallout of Mary and Diana's marriages really brings trouble to the door of both queens. Elizabeth can't ignore the situation that is in unfolding in Scotland. And of course, Elizabeth II is completely unable to just sit back and watch this disaster unfold before her eyes. In 1986, Elizabeth II receives Princess Diana for a chat behind closed doors. Diana has discovered evidence that Prince Charles is having an affair. For Princess Diana, there was a hope that somehow the Queen would intervene to make things okay in her marriage again. But there was a communication problem between two very different generations, between two strong women. There was a certain school of traditional royal thought that Diana should stop being silly. For Elizabeth, there is only one thing for Diana to do. Put a lid on her marital problems and protect the reputation of the House of Windsor and the monarchy. Elizabeth II is a personally, as well as professionally, religious woman who in her childhood was scarred by her uncle's abdication to marry a divorced woman. So everything in Queen Elizabeth's background steers her towards the sanctity of marriage. And certainly, she'd have seen marriage as something to be worked on and subservient to preserving the future of the throne. But Diana wasn't made like that. Diana was, was angry. Diana was defiant. She thought, the heck with this, I am not going to be swept under the carpet. Centuries before, Elizabeth I is disappointed to find out that Mary, Queen of Scots, has ended up in a troubled marriage of her own. Mary has chosen to marry a powerful English nobleman called Lord Darnley. Very early in Mary's reign, she married Henry Lord Darnley. Now, it was a love match for her. She fell head over heels. But Darnley was unsuitable in every single way as a consort. He was hot-headed, arrogant. He was actually quite a cruel man. So the marriage became absolutely toxic. Elizabeth receives a panicked letter from Mary. She's now pregnant 
and wants the Queen's support to protect her from her abusive husband. This is one of the most dramatic letters when it's all started to go horribly wrong for Mary. Her husband, Darnley, has murdered her favourite uh, secretary, who Mary calls our most special servant, has been slain in our own presence. So she's writing to Elizabeth to tell her the full horror of this incident and also to beg Elizabeth as a fellow female sovereign, show a bit of solidarity and come and help Mary in her hour of need. But just like Elizabeth II, Elizabeth I's advice is to stick with the marriage. Darnley is a hugely influential nobleman. Upsetting him could throw Mary's crown and Scotland into disorder. Elizabeth I's relationship to Mary's marriage was a controversial one. She was urging her kinswoman and fellow queen, Mary, to put duty first. Despite Elizabeth's advice, the situation soon turns to chaos. A faction of Mary's supporters rise up and murder Lord Darnley. And Elizabeth is horrified to learn that Mary is now planning to marry the man accused of her husband's murder, Lord Bothwell. Elizabeth writes Mary this desperate letter saying, please don't marry him, please don't marry him. I exhort you, I counsel and I beseech you because he could be guilty of your husband's death. That letter, it's like the verbal equivalent of shaking someone by their shoulders, saying, what are you doing? The Queen's pleas fall on deaf ears and Mary goes ahead with the marriage. Elizabeth was appalled. The behavior of any one ruling queen impacted on the other. If Mary was going to look like this reckless, perhaps even murderous woman, what did that say about her sister queen across the border? 400 years later, Elizabeth II is also facing the danger of a seismic family fallout. The Queen is aghast to discover that the grisly details of Charles' affair are about to be published in a new warts and all book. And Princess Diana is rumored to be the source. Now that was a subterfuge by Princess Diana to get her message out to the outside world about the reality of her marriage. But what is so revealing is the royal establishment's response to it was not to say, Oh my God, is this true? What can we do to put it right? The response was, oh my God, how could she? Isn't she awful? The queen makes a move to try and limit the damage. She tells Charles and Diana that they must attend a royal trip to South Korea and make it work, at least in front of the cameras. If looks could kill, here we have a photograph of Princess Diana and Prince Charles. They have been sent on this diplomatic mission at the request of the Queen to make it look as though they are maintaining appearances. But what this image of Diana shows is that she will not play that part. Her feelings are drowning out any sense of the responsibilities. Diana is is going rogue. Diana is not keeping to the brief of what is required of a royal princess. Overseas tours are some of the most important bits of duty that the royal family does. It is high level diplomacy, certainly an area that you shouldn't bring your private difficulties into. Shortly after their return from South Korea, Diana starts to openly discuss a separation. The situation is slipping out of Elizabeth's control, 
towards the one thing she is desperate to avoid, a divorce for the heir to the throne. And in 1567, Elizabeth I hears that Mary's new marriage to Bothwell is now also on the way out. The Scottish lords have risen up in outrage and rebellion at her marriage to her previous husband's murderer. Bothwell and Mary are forced apart. He escapes across the North Sea, while Mary flees south over the border to England. She comes to England to seek sanctuary and also to get Elizabeth's help to restore her to the Scottish throne. But when Elizabeth learns of Mary's presence in her country, it quickly becomes clear that the Scottish throne is the least of her worries. Mary's religious background makes her an attractive prospect for some very powerful factions. Mary was a Catholic, and for Catholics, both in England and around the continent, she was the rightful Queen of England. For Catholics, it was outrageous that Elizabeth was on the throne. They want Mary on the English throne because they know that she would restore Catholicism, the religion that Elizabeth's father had effectively got rid of. Elizabeth's advisers implore her to execute Mary as quickly as possible. But the Queen doesn't agree. She fears that if she kills her cousin and fellow Queen, it could set a very dangerous precedent. Elizabeth is in this double bind. If she doesn't kill Mary, Queen of Scots, the danger carries on. If she does, it makes possible the end of her own reign by also dramatic means. Elizabeth resolves to keep Mary under house arrest. But soon, the Queen can see that imprisoning her has only increased Mary's status as a romantic icon for the Catholic resistance. Elizabeth I is surprised by how much public sympathy Mary, Queen of Scots, gets even after she's left her throne, even when she's made marriages that seem very unwise. There's this huge amount of passion and sympathy. She's seen as this tragic queen. Both Diana and Mary really, I think, surprise the queens about how much sympathy they get. With Charles and Diana now living apart, and evidence in the press that Diana has also been having affairs, Elizabeth II is perturbed to discover that public support for the princess is only growing. It really was, Diana, we love you, we're with you, we're behind you. And it must have puzzled the Queen, you know, why that someone who in her terms was breaking the rules, was doing what wasn't right, should be the one who garnered this massive international outpouring of sympathy. Later that year, the fallout from the Diana saga literally hits home for the Queen. A fire rips through Elizabeth's beloved childhood home, Windsor Castle, destroying countless historic rooms. But the public's reaction to the disaster is surprisingly unsympathetic. It wasn't just accepted that the people would help to pay for the repair of uh, this symbol of royal authority. It is very remarkable for a monarchist paper like the Daily Mail to be saying that no, the nation didn't want to pay for the repairs to the Queen's home. Why should a hard-pressed ordinary people be footing the bill? In the words of one of my more sympathetic correspondents, it has turned out to be an annus horribilis. There was a backlash that she now faced from her people. They were beginning to question the monarchy and particularly question how much the monarchy should be financially supported. I'm not sure that would have happened without Diana. 
In the face of an increasing threat, both queens react by cutting off communication completely. Elizabeth II makes it known she will never meet Diana in private again. And Elizabeth I resolves that she will never meet her cousin Mary. But both queens will soon learn that avoidance will only make things much worse. Both Elizabeth's attempts to contain their problematic royal relatives soon go amiss. Elizabeth I discovers that while in England under house arrest, Mary has become involved in a Catholic plot to assassinate her and take the throne. And Elizabeth II faces a rebellion of her own when Princess Diana agrees to a television interview about the demise of her marriage. There's definitely a moment when both Mary and Diana become outright rebels, enemies to the queens. So for Mary, it's after she arrives in England and she starts to involve herself in various plots against Elizabeth. And for Diana, it's when she goes public. And that is striking a killer blow. In 1995, Diana sits down with the BBC's Martin Bashir and spills all the personal details about her failed royal marriage to an audience of 22 million people. That panorama broadcast was a declaration of war and it was accepted as such by the Queen um, and, and the House of Windsor. Shortly after, the Queen writes to Charles and Diana instructing them to divorce. And in a shock move, she also demands that as part of the deal, Diana will lose her title. The stripping of the HRH from Diana, I see as a rare instance of spite on, on the part of Elizabeth II. The Queen's cool to some extent deserted her and combat was engaged. Elizabeth I has the power to be much more brutal. For years, she has resisted calls to have Mary executed, but under immense pressure, she now finally starts to crumble. Elizabeth has taken on the greatest dark night of her soul with Mary, Queen of Scots. To make the decision to execute her, she really doesn't want to. Elizabeth finally signs the order for Mary's execution. But she almost immediately regrets her decision and calls it back. Elizabeth claimed that she hadn't meant to sign the warrant, she wasn't sure what she'd been given to sign, and that she then tried to revoke it, but it was too late. Of course, her ministers took the warrant straight up to Fotheringay so that Mary might be executed. They realised that if they wait days, weeks to sort of decide on how this is going to happen. Elizabeth may well have changed her mind, and so they act decisively, they act quickly. On the 8th of February, 1587, Elizabeth I is told that Mary is dead. This is what's left of the Mercedes in which the Princess of Wales and her companion, Dodi al -Fayed, were being driven back to his house. In the early hours of the 31st of August, 1997, Queen Elizabeth II is woken with her own terrible news. It's difficult to think of words that convey the shock that I remember feeling, you know, that everybody around, just total consternation, or the imagery of it, a tunnel in Paris. As the shocking news spreads around the globe, of Princess Diana's death, the Queen, who is staying at Balmoral, seems to freeze. In the morning, the family attends their private church, but something is missing from the sermon. The service in the local church lasted an hour, but not once was the princess mentioned by name. 
There were prayers said for Charles, for Diana's sons, but not for Diana herself. And I think everyone felt that however correct that was in terms of etiquette, people felt that the rules were being placed above the real emotion. After the service, the Queen returns to Balmoral without acknowledging the hordes of press waiting for a statement. Over the next few days, public figures from across the world pay tribute to Diana. She was the people's princess. And that's how she will stay, how she will remain in our hearts and in our memories. But the Queen remains silent. Elizabeth I also withdraws completely. There are accounts of Elizabeth sinking into bouts of depression just by the sheer kind of emotional anguish that comes from that event. She's having nightmares afterwards, being really angst-ridden about it. As the news of Mary's death spreads, there is a flood of public sympathy for the tragic queen. There was a real outpouring of grief. Even those loyal to Elizabeth felt shocked that Mary had at last been put to death. In a sense, Mary's death makes her even more of a threat to Elizabeth, if that's possible, because now she's not just a Catholic figurehead, she's a Catholic martyr. And now people are going to do all sorts of things in her name. The ordinary people, no matter what had happened, the fact that she was painted to them in the most dreadful lights, they still loved her. Mary Queen of Scots was the queen of people's hearts. She really was. There was a quite staggering outpouring of grief in the wake of Diana's death. People were keeping all night vigils. I remember visiting Kensington Gardens myself on my way home from work and you could hear the crying. It was as if people had lost a member of their family. The crowds gather around Buckingham Palace, looking and waiting for a sign from their queen. You know, even a single candle in a window, a bagpiper playing a a lament would have been all it took to show that the monarchy had registered this event. But the failure to show, even in a small way, that they recognized the depth of people's feeling, I think, was the most damaging and avoidable mistake. After five days of deafening silence from the Queen, all over Britain, grief turns to anger. The horror, the shock at Diana's death, this young mother dying in this horrific situation, a lot of that becomes really channeled towards the Queen. The papers were very outspoken. It was, your people need you, Mom, was one headline. Show us you care. There was this outcry about the question of a flag over Buckingham Palace. It felt like a deliberate snub. The flag at half-mast, definitely. Definitely. Should have been done before now. I really can't understand that thing. And I think it's a big disgrace for, for the royal family not to, not to do that. Soon, the public's anger becomes loaded with questions about whether the monarchy should exist at all. Over the length of her reign, people have questioned whether a hierarchy of privilege based on uh, birth and not merit she should be the thing that represents Britain. There was a moment where her throne looked quite threatened by a sense of real public outrage, a sense of the Queen having got it wrong. Elizabeth I is also facing a public backlash. In the aftermath of Mary, Queen of Scots' execution, the whole Catholic world rises up in revulsion. King Philip II of Spain the world's richest and most powerful man vows to avenge Mary, the Catholic Queen. 
he launches the mighty Spanish Armada. 130 galleons are on their way to invade England and destroy Elizabeth. The Armada is the single most serious threat that Elizabeth has faced in 30 years as queen. It looks like England is going to be vanquished by the might of Spain. And in the days after Diana's death, there is quite a volatile atmosphere in England. It almost feels like there's some kind of rebellion brewing. There's definitely a feeling that something has changed. This is the closest the Queen comes to disaster, to people questioning the monarchy, to people saying, what is the monarchy for? The deaths of Mary Queen of Scots and Diana, these push our Queens, Elizabeth I and Elizabeth II, to the closest moments of crisis that they have throughout their whole reigns. But our two Queens are in hiding and on the brink of a major disaster. Elizabeth I and Elizabeth II both make the same bold decision. Faced with a dangerous crisis that could topple them from the throne, they prepare to face the fallout of Diana and Mary's deaths head on by addressing their people directly. Both women here are facing turning points and had to step forward with the same challenge facing them. With a Spanish invasion force of 30,000 troops gathering across the English Channel, Elizabeth I tells her advisors that she will ride down to the south coast and personally address her troops. Elizabeth chose this moment with the armada just off England's shores to ride out into danger, really. She doesn't want to be seen to be in an ivory tower, sort of holed away in one of her palaces, distant from her people as they're facing this threat. On the 9th of August, 1588, Queen Elizabeth I arrives on the south coast and prepares to address her troops. Queen Elizabeth I's Tilbury speech is her answer to every threat that there's ever been to her as a female Protestant queen, that Catholic Europe will come for you. I have come among you now as your queen. That's how she begins her speech. She is among her people. She isn't creating this traditional distance between the monarch and their subject. How extraordinary to be there watching your queen speaking to you, this woman of bravery and courage. And she says, I know I have the body, but of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king and of a king of England too. That very neat balance between the body of a feeble woman and the heart and stomach of a king, which admits her weaknesses, but then transcends them really effectively so that you forget about them. She's there, she's ready to stand and fight shoulder to shoulder with her army. And she makes it very, very clear that she is devoted to England. This is Elizabeth's great speech at the time of crisis. Her words, they rouse people. It really is very like that moment when Elizabeth II addressed the nation at her great moment of crisis, Diana's death. With the anger over Diana's death now threatening to take down the entire institution of the monarchy, the Queen decides that the time has come for her to speak directly to the nation. This is the greatest moment of crisis in her reign. She has to get back the public affection. There is this anger against her. If she got this one wrong, it would be yet another nail in the coffin of the monarchy. And the Queen is the only one who can save it. Everything is riding on this one public TV address. The day before Princess Diana's funeral, Queen Elizabeth II finally arrives at Buckingham Palace and heads to the live broadcast room. 
There is a huge amount of pressure on the Queen at this moment. If she comes across as in any way aloof, then really there are going to be disastrous consequences. What I say to you now, as your Queen and as a grandmother, I say from my heart. First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. In good times and bad, she never lost her capacity to smile and laugh. She tries to reduce that very traditional distance between herself and her people. And now she shows herself to have a much more human, even vulnerable side. I, for one, believe there are lessons to be drawn from her life and from the extraordinary and moving reaction to her death. I share in your determination to cherish her memory. Showing feeling for Diana, showing feeling for the people, this is something she has never done in all her many, many years on the throne. That speech turns everything around. She sounded very sincere, and she looked as though she was very moved. And I think that will satisfy everyone. I thought it was a grandmother speaking and not a queen. I was quite moved by it. I thought she said everything she should have said. Can't think of anything that she left out at all. It's one of those moments when you can feel history turning, and the lump comes to the throat, and suddenly all is right again. It is an extraordinary comparison across the centuries between two women who both managed to sway the course of history through what they say to their people. Just a day after Queen Elizabeth I delivers her speech at Tilbury, she is told of incredible news. Sir Francis Drake and the English Royal Navy have scattered the Spanish Armada. Elizabeth has defeated the mighty power of Spain and in doing so, secured her legacy. There's a wonderful portrait of Elizabeth I called the Armada portrait. And it's particularly wonderful because of the aura of power that it seems to possess. This portrait has Elizabeth with her long white hand on the globe as the mistress of the world. And beyond, you look out onto the sea where the Spanish ships are burning. And that's such a fantastic encapsulation of Elizabeth as Gloriana, as the Queen of England. In the years that follow the Diana crisis, Queen Elizabeth II's popularity also goes from strength to strength as she continues to carry out her duties with unwavering dedication. She's also managed to have a little fun along the way. Elizabeth II commands great affection and respect, whether people are great monarchists or republicans. And whatever comes next, her reign will define uh, uh, the monarchy in a way, I think, that will never be repeated. It is perhaps the last of its kind. We have seen how Elizabeth I and II share some remarkable similarities, both coming from royal obscurity to win over doubters and strengthen their nation's position in the world. They have overcome tragedy and adversity to secure their place in history as two of Britain's longest reigning and most successful monarchs. Elizabethan England, that was a great age for our country. And Francis Drake, Walter Raleigh, Shakespeare. I think we can rightly take pride in that. And it wouldn't have worked like that if she'd been a different sort of woman. Elizabeth II, driven by the same mental fortitude, the same sense of duty, in a totally different age, she has triumphed as well. This woman has made the second Elizabethan age come true. Um, she's given real meaning to it for people. And as you see, made us feel quite emotional about it. These two queens, Elizabeth I and Elizabeth II, really confirm that queens 
do it better. Princess Diana take our two queens on difficult journeys. In fact, there are an awful lot of parallels, almost a magical quality to them. We uncover remarkable similarities. This letter is astonishing. Once upon a time, they were best friends. Now they are mortal rivals. And reveal how these young women both threaten to destroy the reigns of two of our greatest monarchs. The story of Queen Elizabeth I and Elizabeth II's rise to the throne has revealed some intriguing similarities. Both women rose from royal obscurity to become popular and successful monarchs. And their journey has made them both unflinching and dedicated queens. What unites the two queens is their sense of tradition and duty. But neither of the Elizabeths were supposed to be queen at all. They had a fairly tortuous path to the throne. But that wasn't the end of their battle. It was just the beginning. Both Elizabeths battle with two very different women that enter their lives. Mary, Queen of Scots and Princess Diana. <laughs> 